All right, good morning, everybody. All right, uh, so a little exercise real quick. Show of hands, how many people have Facebook or Instagram? Show of hands, show of hands, show of hands. Awesome, like 90% just in this room. So that's pretty much the same amount as the entire world has social media. All right, so one of the things that uh, PK and I kind of tried to do, I guess this summer of 2020, was really to get kind of our social media kind of ministry going, right? Get Sawyer's Creek Baptist Church uh, out to everybody uh, and reach as, as far as we could. And the impact was almost immediate. Like we saw uh, traffic on our social media sites uh, skyrocket uh, within the first handful of months. Uh, over the last year, uh, due to some things, uh, I had to take uh, a lot of time off, so our social media accounts kind of kind of dwindled. Uh, but I'm back and, and we're going at it hard. Uh, so I have an entire campaign set up for our social media accounts. So every, the goal is every day to put something out. All right? um, with uh, the goal and the intention of having interaction from people. Right? So we don't want our social media ministry to just be us advertising Sawyer's Creek Baptist Church. We want interaction, we want back and forth, we want communication. All right? So you're gonna see things, uh, you probably already seen over the last week or so, uh, if you follow our Facebook and Instagram pages, uh, some inter, uh, interaction Q&A on Mondays and Wednesdays, devotional posts on Tuesdays, uh, and then we got uh, Fun Facts Friday, so I put out like, grab, like a, a fun Bible fact, I'll put that out on Fridays, uh, and then Thursdays and Ask Me Anything Day, so I encourage you to, to message our Facebook or Instagram accounts or send us an email. Uh, it can be literally about anything, like the example I used was, you know, does PK prefer Popeye's chicken sandwich over chicken filet? Uh, so just any way to kind of just get to get us interacting uh, through social media and the biggest thing I need from everybody here is to interact with our with our pages all right like the posts share the posts ask questions interact make comments right because all those interactions those statements those shares that boosts our numbers in social media's magical algorithms and it gets our stuff on the top end of news feeds everywhere all right, so they're public sites, so the more interaction we have with it, the more it puts SCBC out there to everybody, all right, and then allows us to reach and touch more people. Uh, so I encourage you, if you're not already doing so, go over to Facebook, like Sawyer's Creek Church, go over to Instagram, like Sawyer's Creek Baptist Church on Instagram, all right, but interact with it. All right? It's not just us putting out information just for the fun of it. It's really meant and, and geared towards you guys interacting with us and asking us questions and liking posts and making comments and getting two-way comms going uh, to get us out there. Uh, so I thank you guys very much. It's a ministry that can reach a lot of people. A lot of people have cell phones in their hands on a regular basis. All right, so we can get to people's living rooms right in the palm of their hands if you guys just help us out and interact with us. All right, so if you have any questions, please um, find me, talk to me, ask me questions. Uh, if you have any suggestions, recommendations, I'm all ears. Uh, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. If I were you, I would have given up on me by now. I would have labeled me a lost cause, because I feel just like a lost cause. If I were you, I would have turned around and walked away. Would have labeled me beyond repair. Cause I feel like I'm beyond repair Oh, but somehow you don't see me like I do Somehow you're still here You're the God who stays You're the God who stays You're the one who runs in my direction When the whole world walks away You're the God who stays separate my heart from the God who stays. I used to hide every time I thought I'd let you down. I always thought I had to earn my way. But I'm learning you don't work that way, no. Cause somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still here. You're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from the God who
Xerxes was a wicked king from a wicked kingdom. His kingdom was built on immorality and brutal judgments. However, as we've learned throughout the book of Esther so far, there is a better king, and he has a better kingdom, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus gets the final word on everything that happens in heaven and on earth. And sometimes King Jesus decides that he's going to use a human like Esther to make sure that his righteous judgment and justice is prevailing in his kingdom. And so this is episode four of her story. I like to explore, and that gets me into a lot of trouble. Uh, I have, I'm the guy that gets kicked out of the Smithsonian because I wander down the wrong hallway. I'm the guy on the cave tour that wanders off from the tour and falls into the hole. Uh, my one brush with the law in my 42 years of existence um, was when I was exploring tunnels under Huntington, West Virginia. Uh, who knew that it was against the law to explore steam tunnels? Uh, I certainly didn't. Uh, I was like, what's the worst that can happen? Am I going to steal some sewer rats? Am I going to find some ninja turtles? I, I, I thought it was kind of comical um, until I had to stand before a judge. And uh, my friend told me, he said, isn't it interesting that the, the, <laughs> the next words out of this man's mouth are going to dictate the course of your life? I was like, whoa, wait a minute. Because at that moment, it, it sunk in that like, it, this could be something they throw out. This could be a misdemeanor. This could be a felony. And like my life could be changed forever based on this one dumb decision to go exploring. Well, fortunately, I was a good kid, and so the judge threw it out, and no big deal. But it, what, what surprised me, though, was just the, the amount of power that this one person held over my life. So we've been talking about King Xerxes as a king, which he was, but what we also need to understand is that Xerxes was also a judge, and he was a judge with unmatched influence. Let's go to verse 19 of chapter 2 real quick. It says, When the virgins were gathered a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther still did not reveal her family background or her ethnicity, as Mordecai had directed. She obeyed Mordecai's orders, as she always had while he raised her. Uh, the women who did not win the Bachelor of Persia competition were paraded around the kingdom. And Mordecai was there to witness this because he had been promoted to a new position by now Queen Esther. And he was sitting at a place called the King's Gate. The King's Gate was kind of like the business center of the community. The government buildings and everything would be right there in this place. And uh, it's kind of like where the elders would all gather and they would settle disputes they would give out their judgments. So, for example, um, Big Thug might come up and say, hey, uh, this guy stole the rims off my goat cart, or Shaz guys may uh, accuse his neighbor of stealing tomatoes from the garden. And the elders, like Judge Judy style, would hear this, uh, this complaint, and then they would give their, their ruling. And so a lot of uh, business deals went down in this area. Um, some of them were legit, and some of them were shady. And it says in verse 21 that during those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Big Thin and Teresh, which was a hip-hop duo, apparently, um, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the entrance became infuriated and planned to assassinate King Xerxes. Uh, this is not the first nor the last time that King Xerxes would receive a, a death threat. And as a matter of fact, in 465 BC, he was murdered in his bedroom uh, in a similar scam, uh, a plot like this. So these eunuchs that were in charge of the king's apartment, became upset with the king's unmatched influence and unmatched power. Uh, apparently, he didn't rule in their favor in some way, and so they decided that they were going to kill him. And they were discussing their plot in front of Mordecai, who was, again, at the king's gate. 
So Mordecai hears them, and he's faced with a, a really tough decision. Like, like, do I save the life of this really bad man by telling what I heard? Do I dance with the devil I know or dance with the devil that I don't? So we see that in verse 22, uh, it says, Mordecai learned of the plot, and he reported it to Queen Esther. And she told the king on Mordecai's behalf. When the report was investigated and verified, both men were hanged on the gallows. This event was recorded in the historical record in the king's presence. So Mordecai decides to tell Esther about this plot that he's uh, heard that the king was going to be assassinated. And the, the people investigated the allegation. They got the who, what, when, why, and where. They put it all in the FBI, the criminal report, and they presented it to the king. And the king decided that he wanted to have these men executed. Because not only do kings have unmatched influence, they also have the right to punish. And it says they, they hung them on the gallows, which is really interesting because the, the gallows at this time, it actually means to be crucified. See, the Persians invented crucifixion. The Romans perfected it. So these men were actually crucified for their sin against the king. So the king has the right to punish people for their sin, but he also has the authority the right to reward them for their obedience. If you look at verse 1 of chapter 3 now, it says, After all of this took place, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamathida, the Agagite, and he promoted him in rank and gave him a higher position than all of the other officials. The entire royal staff at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman because the king had commanded this to be done to him. But Mordecai would not bow down nor pay homage. Xerxes did nothing to re reward Mordecai for reporting this assassination attempt. He, he had the FBI report. He had all of the names listed out there. Esther told him that it was Mordecai who revealed this plot, yet he decides to promote Haman, the Agagite. Now, Agagites belonged to the Amalekites, which were the mortal enemies of the Jews like Mordecai. In Exodus 17, 15, we read that war with them will be from generation to generation. So Jews and Amalekites have hated each other for generation after generation. And now this Amalekite is Mordecai's boss. This Amalekite was rewarded when Mordecai was not. In sixth grade, there was a staple incident in my, my class. And I'm not going to tell you what happened because I don't want to give our kids any ideas. Um, but there, there was a staple incident that was so severe that they actually canceled our field trip to the amusement park. Well, that, was, that didn't set well with me because I like to get out of school and I like amusement parks. And so I did my own investigation and I found out that these two boys were the ones that did the staple incident and I ratted them out. I told on them, they got in trouble and the field trip was back on. And so I sat back waiting on my reward. I thought my, the teachers and my classmates would be so impressed with me. They would thank me for saving the field trip. But all I got was beat up at the bus stop by the two boys that I ratted out. I'm still bitter about that to this day, and I'm going to write Miss Chapman an email um, right after this service to let her know that I'm still very bitter. I didn't get what I deserved, right? I actually got the thing I didn't deserve, which was beat up. Of course, some would argue the other way. but um, So Mordecai, as you can imagine, is infuriated by this oversight, and he refuses to bow down. So in verse 3 and 4, the tattletales come out, and they tell the king, they tell Haman that this Mordecai guy is not bowing down. They're like the middle school kids. It's like, fight, fight, fight. You know, they're kind of instigating and stirring it up uh, to try to cause trouble. So Mordecai gets called out for disobeying Haman, but also for disobeying King Xerxes. In verse 5, it says that when Haman saw Mordecai was not bowing down or paying homage, he was filled with rage. And when he learned Mordecai's ethnic identity, it seemed repugnant to Haman to do away with Mordecai alone. So he planned to destroy Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout King Xerxes' kingdom. Friends, sin, disobedience to God has lasting consequences. Because if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 15, you'll read a story about how God told King Saul to eliminate all of the Amalekites, to kill them all and to, take, and to not take any of their stuff. Now, these Amalekites had stood against God and his people for several years, so they were basically reaping what they had already sown. Um, but Saul did not listen to God. As a matter of fact, he, he won the war, but he allowed a lot of the Amalekites to live for political reasons, and he also took some of their stuff. And so this potential genocide, years later, could have been avoided if Saul would have listened to what God told him to do. Disobeying God comes at a cost. It came at a cost to the Amalekites, to the Israelites, to Mordecai, and also 
to Esther. So the king has the right to punish, he has the right to reward, and he also has the authority to judge. Look at verse 8 now. Haman is obsessed, and he's, he's focused on this one guy that wouldn't bow down. Some of you have probably been in that situation where there's this one person in your life that just will not show you the respect that you deserve, and you fixate on that one person. You could have a thousand other people doing exactly as they should, but that, that one person in your life doesn't do what you want them to do, and it gives the devil a foothold into your life, and it starts to consume your thoughts. Well, that's what happened to Haman, and his thoughts took him all the way to genocide. Look at verse 8 now. Then Haman informed King Xerxes, there is one ethnic group scattered throughout the people in every province in your kingdom, keeping themselves separate. Their laws are different from everyone else, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not the king's best interest to tolerate them. If the king approves, let an order be drawn up authorizing their destruction, and I will pay 375 tons of silver to the officials for deposit in the royal treasury. The king removed his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, son of Hamathida, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Then the king told Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with as you see fit. So Haman's plan, kill all the Jews, take their stuff, and give all the money to the king to secure his position with the king for the rest of his life. Now, what we notice about this king, King Xerxes, is that he is lazy. King Xerxes is lazy. He doesn't even investigate these claims, because if he had, he would have found out that most of what Haman was saying here is an absolute bold-faced lie. But he's too lazy to investigate, so he just gives his ring, which means he gives his authority to Haman to do whatever Haman sees fit. We also see that he's greedy. He doesn't need this money. He can't spend the money that he has. But as Ecclesiastes says, he who loves money never has enough. And so King Xerxes is the personification of that statement. He just wants more money. He has the right to judge the situation. But unfortunately, he is greedy and he is lazy, and he is also heartless. The king gets to pick the day of judgment as well. Look at verse 13 now. Letters are sent by couriers to each royal province telling officials to destroy, kill, and annihilate all of the Jewish people. By the way, those are the same words that were used in many of Hitler's speeches when he was talking about the Jews. It says, young and old, women and children, plundered their possessions on a single day, the 13th day of Adar, the 12th month heavy language. Can you imagine the horror of knowing that there was a day that is coming where you and all of your people would be killed on the same day? Xerxes is heartless. Look at verse 15. The couriers left, spurred by the royal command, and the law was issued in the fortress of Susa, and the king and Haman sat down to drink while the city of Susa was in confusion. Xerxes and Haman closed this business deal with a drink. How utterly heartless. They're like, well, what a great day. We made some money and we committed genocide. Cheers. Can you imagine the, the nerve of these two men to be able to do this? So heartless and cold and cruel. What I do like about this story, though, is that the city of Susa was in an uproar. They, they were showing the, the heart of God toward injustice they're like, no, these, these are our Jewish friends. They love us, and we love them. They are our neighbors. Our kids go to school together. They play ball together. This guy's on the Lions Club with me. We don't want to kill them. They're modeling the, the greatest commandment that Jesus gave, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and also to love your neighbor as yourself. But here's the problem. Even though their heart was right, they had no authority. They, they couldn't stop this from happening, at least they thought they couldn't. They just go along with the judgment. Why? Because the king has unmatched power, unmatched authority. He has the right to punish, he has the right to reward, and he has the authority to judge and also to pick the day of judgment. And so even though the city is against them, they have no choice but to go along with this command to kill all of the Jews. And what this story should be doing in your heart right now is reminding you of the fact that there is a better judge. There is a better judge, and his name is Jesus. Now think about it this way. Like Xerxes, Jesus has unmatched influence. In John it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and by the Word all things were created. 
Jesus is the word, and the word has unmatched influence. Like Xerxes, Jesus had the power to punish. It says in Scripture, the wages of sin is death. That means the payment for our sin, what we receive for being sinners, is death. So he had the power to punish. Like Xerxes, Jesus has the right to reward. He said it himself, I will reward each according to what they have done. Like Xerxes, Jesus has the authority to judge. He told his disciples, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me by the Father. So Jesus has the authority to judge, and God gave him that authority. And like Xerxes, God picks the day of judgment. There's an interesting scripture in your Bible. It says, but about the day or the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. What that tells us is that God has already picked the day when judgment will happen. And no one else knows that day except for him. Like Xerxes, Jesus has the choice, the the power to help or harm, to deliver or destroy. It says in Scripture, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive what is due for the things that we have done while in the body, whether they were good or whether they were bad. So Xerxes and Jesus, a lot alike, right? But here's the big difference. Unlike Xerxes, Jesus was not lazy, he was not greedy, and he was not heartless. There's a fact in this story that's overlooked a lot of times, but I want to bring you back to it. It's in verse 12. God put this in here specifically for us to remind us that he is the better judge. It says, The royal scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month. Interesting little detail. Why would we put it in Scripture? Well, God put it in Scripture because what it is, that day is the eve of Passover. For, for Jewish readers, they would be thinking back to Egypt when God's people, the Israelites, were held captive by the Egyptians and they were liberated from the tyranny of an evil Pharaoh that was running an evil kingdom. And it happened in one night, Passover night. See, what they would do is, on that night, they would go and they, each household would find a spotless lamb. And they would sacrifice the spotless lamb and they would put the blood of the spotless lamb on the doorpost of their house. And when the angel of death went over the, the homes in Egypt that night, when he saw the, the blood of the spotless lamb on the doorpost of the home, he would pass over that house and go on to the next, sparing their lives, saving those people. God has every right to judge sinners. He is a just God. And so he has every right to punish us accordingly. And I say us because the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God, instead of pouring out his judgment on us, decided to pour out his judgment on the perfect spotless lamb, his son, Jesus Christ, crucifying him instead of crucifying us so that we have the right to choose to be saved. Yes, there is a a day of judgment that is coming. That day is in the future, but our grace-filled, loving, kind, just God has given us a way to be pardoned. He's given us Jesus. So my encouragement for you this morning is to not allow your life to be marked by the the woulda, coulda, shoulda. Because if you look back through the story so far, we're, we're barely three chapters in, and we've already seen a lot of people that woulda, coulda, shoulda done different things than what they did. For example, Saul should have listened to God, should have obeyed him. Israel should have repented of their sins. Esther's parents and Mordecai, they should have went back to Jerusalem as God told them to do it. Esther should have revealed her nationality and her ethnicity and her faith. Xerxes should have asked Queen Vashti for forgiveness. Xerxes should have listened to more trustworthy and wise people. Xerxes should not have overlooked Mordecai, and Mordecai should not have become obsessed and allowed his his pride to keep him from respecting this man that was placed in authority over him. And Haman should not have obsessed over Mordecai's lack of respect. Would have, could have, should have. So the question this morning is like, what's yours? What's your would have, could have, should have moment? Maybe you should have given your life to Jesus and you haven't chosen to do that yet. Maybe you should have asked that person for forgiveness. Maybe you should have listened to Jesus and followed him and obeyed him. Well, maybe you should have 
not obsessed with that one person's lack of respect. Maybe you should have not let pride get in your way of that decision that you needed to make. Well, here's the good news about your judge. The Bible says that your judge, the good judge, God himself, says that if you confess your sin, he is able and what? He's able and just. It's justice. He is able and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. God does not hold your woulda, coulda, shoulda against you. They've all had bad moments, but you know what? God's grace is bigger than their mistakes. It's bigger than their bad moments. And all they have to do is confess their sin to God, and he forgets and forgives. He washes away that sin and puts them back on solid ground. Your, your judge is a good judge. Xerxes is a terrible judge, but Jesus is a better judge. Father, we are so grateful this morning that we set under the rule and authority of the better judge, the perfect judge, a judge that is full of love and kindness. Father, you are not, you are not lazy, you are not greedy, you are not heartless, you are full of amazing love. Father, help us to, to focus on that truth this morning because I know that there are some that have come into this place and some that are watching online right now. Father, that they don't feel worthy of your love. They're looking back at their past and they're saying, man, I should have done this different. I, I wish I would have done this. I, I, and so now my life is just ruined. It's, it's marked by this thing. And Father, what you are saying is I'm the good judge. And I don't hold that guilt over your head. I've already satisfied my judgment, my wrath, by punishing my perfect, spotless son, Jesus, on your behalf. You have already been pardoned of that sin. That, that habit, that addiction, that secret thing that you've done, that no longer defines who you are because you can be forgiven. All you have to do is ask, and you will receive. Because God is able and he is just to forgive you. So thank you, God, for being a, a better judge. And I pray right now that the weight of our past would just be taken off of our shoulders and placed at the foot of the cross so that we can be free to be the people of God that you've called us to be. Our lives cannot be full of joy and and passion, and we can't be a good witness if we're living in the past and looking at our mistakes. So Lord, help us to see that the judgment has already been made and we have been set free, pardoned by the blood of Jesus Christ, the spotless lamb that was poured out for us. Lord, your, your anger, your wrath, your just judgment toward our sin has passed over us and onto him so that we, Lord, can live in the good news of the gospel, saying, I am forgiven. So Father, this morning, I pray that you would free us. You would help us to leave this place with joy in our heart, knowing that our good judge, our heavenly Father, has seen that we are forgiven. And I pray that that joy would permeate everything that we do, all of our relationships, uh, when we go to school, when we go to work, when we're hanging out at our house and with our friends. I pray that that grace and mercy that we've received would just permeate us and then come out of us to the world around us so that people will know that you are real, that you change lives, and that the gospel is truly good news for them. So Lord, thank you for what you've done this morning in this place. And as we close down this service, sing that great hymn one, one, one more time, Jesus paid it all. I pray that those words would be real to us in a way that they've never been real to us before. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand together and let's do that one more time. Let's sing Jesus paid it all, first and last one.